Hey folks, it's Brina Jadav here, Healthier Podcast, coming to you from Heal Circle headquarters. And today we're talking about the digital health revolution with Kevin Perot. Kevin, welcome. Hey, thank you for having me. Now you've written this awesome book about how we can use our smartphones to manage our health. Let's first start with introductions. Tell us a little bit about your background and what drove you to writing this book? Sure. Um, I actually come from the tech sector. Um, I spent an entire career doing strategy and management consulting, but everybody else in my family is in healthcare. Um, about 10 years ago, when digital health first burst onto the scene, I started a consumer health company. I've been in digital health ever since. And recently I wrote The Digital Health Revolution. I was driven to write it by having reconnected with a couple of schoolmates who confided in me that they now have type two diabetes. Um, I asked them, what do you use to manage your condition? And they looked at me like I was from Mars. They didn't really realize any of these solutions were available. So I decided to write The Digital Health Revolution. I thought, you know, what good is all this innovation if nobody knows about it? So I'm on a mission. I actually uh, interviewed 30 of healthcare's top thought leaders and tried to capture and share their insight with average everyday readers. Fantastic. Well, let's get started. Chapter one, our system is broken, but who cares? Let's start with the system being broken. You know, I always say we're not in a health care crisis. We're first of all in a health crisis and we don't have a, a team of brilliant people ready to help with the health care crisis and hence we end up with the health care crisis. Now you said that the system is broken. Talk a little bit about what is the message in this chapter? What system is broken? Well, you know, it's very large and complex healthcare is. And you have all these incumbents and they all have entrenched business models and entrenched ways of doing things. So whenever you try to solve a problem that touches upon really a lot of stakeholders, it's hard to move the needle because people have been historically reluctant to really try to take the initiative because it doesn't scale very well. I think with, you know, with George Bush introducing the um, mandate around uh, electronic health records and then with Barack Obama doubling down on, on the ACA, what's, what that's driven is just an explosion of investment into developing technologies that better engage with people, better uh, allowing us to better connect and collect information on them, and then analyzing that and helping them take action on that. And as you take a look at you know, who the incumbents are, you realize, well, your insurance provider fits in that category, your provider or your doctor definitely fits in that category. But historically, if you've taken a look at how we've defined healthcare, it's really kind of sick care. And I think what we're, we're, we're learning now is that if we start with an appreciation for data, we can extend the healthcare value chain to include things like nutrition, to include things like fitness, and to include things like you know, uh, uh, help with dealing with afflictions that we don't like to talk about, like mental health problems and, and with uh, dependencies on alcohol and drugs. So incredibly, the challenge is the same from population of health to population of health. You have to first engage the party, you have to collect the information, then you have to take action on it in a way that's meaningful for them. So what we've seen is an incredible explosion of of investment and an incredible explosion of exciting new technologies that most, most more often than not, you can access using what's in your pocket already, your smartphone. And when you went out and interviewed some incredibly well-known people, did they admit that the system's broken? Well, you know, interesting point and, and very nuanced, but um, I think there isn't a soul in healthcare that wouldn't acknowledge that it's broken. I guess the, uh, the, the real devil in the details is, well, how do you fix it and what's the best way to move it forward? And I think what we're seeing is uh, alignment and agreement around is evidence-based um, uh, solutions matter. So you need data to be able to generate results that validate that certain tools and tactics and lifestyle coaching choices um, are helping with populations of health, which is what really caused the whole explosion um, of digital health assets. The real question right now is, um, I think, who's doing what and how can you best connect with it? And each segment that you look at of our value chain, you see exciting things going on. 
um, whether it's your provider. Um, I like to give use cases and give people examples of, of you know, how everyday technologies are things that we can use and use to our benefit. Um, when my niece got married, as a for example, um, we were on our way to a destination wedding and I watched my wife and her sister take fat burning pills to look good in their bathing suits. And you know what? It's a myth that guys don't like to look good in our bathing suits. I did the same thing. So um, every morning I have a routine. I step on my scale and I take my blood pressure. And um, along the way, I had lost about 15 or 18 pounds. And man, I was looking good. I was feeling confident. A little jittery, a little kind of on the high end. But, you know, I watched my blood pressure go from 123 over 78 to 165 over 105. Well, who reached out to me but my doctor at One Medical? And he reminded me that my father died of heart failure. And his father died of a heart attack. And all the men in our family seem to be afflicted with high blood pressure, except for yours truly. And here I was managing my weight goals in a way that was inviting the worst possible result for a guy like me. Well, you don't know that if you're my doctor, unless you're tapped into the data that I'm collecting and you're able to help me take action on that um, in, in a very real time and meaningful way. Um, so I, I like to give people examples like that. Now, he also took a look at my blood sugars one of the years that I was going in to see him and said, Kevin, you are pre-diabetic. What's going on? I've never seen sugars, uh, your, your values like this. And I had just gone through a juicing period. So, I mean, how do you know unless you're collecting and, and you're analyzing and you're sharing it with stakeholders who can help keep you healthy? I think that's a real good example of, of how providers are using technology to better connect with their patients. You make two salient points, right? You're juicing because someone out there is saying juice, juice, vegetables, yeah. fruits. And uh, of course, your body is going, are you kidding me? That, <laughs> I just, I, I've run out of insulin. Where's the roughage, right? You know, yeah, I can't, yeah. I can't, why don't you just inject it into my body? Yeah, it, it's crazy. Sometimes we do things that are trendy and we think are, are to our benefit. And, and we really don't know that what we're really doing is hurting ourselves. And how would we, right? Um, well, the way that you, you get to the clarity of vision is, is you get good at capturing information about yourself and learning who to share that with um, and who can help you make better decisions and help you reach the very same goals, but in a better way. At the end of the day, I think we wanna be the healthiest and best version of ourselves that we possibly can be. And that's how we should evaluate these technologies that are available to us. Do they contribute to that? And no two people are the same and that's, I think, for those of you who are listening in, uh, you know, this, this needs to be that big aha moment around you are special, you are unique, you are a snowflake, you're a unique thumbprint, you are not like your neighbor or Kim Kardashian or whoever the hot celebrity is right now that is touting some specific diet that has helped them. You are not them, you are you. And so, as Kevin is saying, as we say on our Heal Circle uh, posts all day long, you have to take charge of figuring out what your health print is. And the only way to do that is to track. You cannot get there without tracking, whether it's a health journal, like you can get for free on our site, or if it's a digital, and we're going we're gonna to get going to the next chapters and talk about what the options are, but getting to tracking you is the number one step, in my opinion, in getting to health. Chapter two, tell me where it hurts. It hurts everywhere, Kevin. It hurts everywhere. <laughs> what is the essence of this chapter? Everybody's got pain, right? Let, let's kind of continue the theme that you just were talking about. Um, you know, you're right. Everyone is individual, right? And when you think about um, how products reach us, in healthcare, it drives you nutty. Like my brother-in-law was the chief scientist at Lilly. And he used to describe it um, kind of this way. He said, you know, you've got the pharmaceutical company way up here at the top of the chain and they make this product. And let's forget all the research and development that goes into making it. Then the doctor prescribes the, 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 the pill or the, uh, the drug, the retailer sells it and you come in and buy it. And look at how far apart we are from one another. 
The only way I can connect to you is by buying information from McKinsey and Pew and Forrester and, and it's all an aggregate, but digital health assets help us connect with you on a one-to-one -one basis without disintermediating anyone in your chain. We haven't dislodged you from your doctor. We're helping you better connect with him um, and we're better connecting with him because we're taking a look at the values, your biometrics on a one-to-one -one basis, and we can see it real time if we need to. So um, I, you know, I, I think that's the best way to sort of get your head around um, you know, the significance to you and the value to you of better connecting and thinking about better connecting along an extended uh, value chain than what you've historically really probably thought about, right? So it's not just your doctor. It's connecting to the drug manufacturer who's prescribing the, you know, uh, prescription for the condition that you're trying to manage and, and understanding how your nutrition choices, your physical activity, and your mental frame of mind are affecting the efficacy of their drugs um, so that they can better help you manage to your condition. Um, I always try to come back with, with uh, 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 examples, and I think that's probably a good example, but every segment of the value chain that you look at, it's not so different, right? I mean, I think what we're really trying to do is better engage. Um, and, and, you know, the, the surprising thing about the whole digital health revolution was how what we had originally thought of was going to be one of the most vexing and daunting of problems was solved by somebody from outside the industry. I mean, you know, when you walk down the street, you'll see people checking their, their uh, Twitter feed, their Facebook feed, their LinkedIn feed, their email, and their text. Why would we have thought it would have been any different for healthcare, right? I mean, if it's a healthcare badge or notification, people are opening up their phone just like they, 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 uh, they do for everything else. So I think, you know, our smartphones have really helped us in terms of better connecting. And we thought that was going to be the most challenging thing. Now, I think what we're realizing is, is that we went through this whole explosion of apps. We went through this whole explosion of analytics platforms. The question really becomes what comes next? And I think that that's the most exciting thing. And that's where we get to connect all the data and start taking action on it, which is really where we're at right now. I like to say Digital Health 1.0 was disproving the popular myth that Rena and Kevin won't engage. We will. You've just never tried or given us the right tools before. Um, and I think we just blew through that one and blasted right into what we call um, and you were talking about it earlier, the whole quantified self movement, which was collecting information about ourselves and then deciding who to share that with and when to share that with them and how we will share that. So in this chapter, Rena, really what we're talking about is um, when we ask where does it hurt, what we're really trying to get people to understand and appreciate is, well, it, it hurts everywhere and it hurts for everyone. It's not good for your doctor if he's not better connected to you, just like it's not good for you if you're not better connected to he or she. Um, and if you view it from that lens, um, your, 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 your pharmacist, your, your pharmaceutical company, um, really anyone in the food chain has this, this pain, right? They don't know how to connect. They don't know how to engage. Um, and the, the whole digital health revolution was all about using your phone to better engage and better connect. So the pain points are, are across the board. It's your doctor has pain points. It's he's got information and, and knowledge. It's difficult to share with you because they don't know where you are at any one given point in time. And by that, I mean, from a physical perspective, from a mental perspective, from a geographical perspective. Um, and I think what we're finding out is that the digital health assets that we talk about in the book are a great conduit for connecting everybody that's in pain along the way. I think the other thing that it's kind of uh, given us an appreciation for is, is that, um, you know, we can make a lot of that pain go away if we're better at connecting, collecting, and sharing the information and that sometimes the area of expertise isn't always provided by the same party. So this whole concept of collecting and, and sharing becomes even more important. Um, if you talk about really any chronic condition, um, heck, 
let's focus on diabetes just for a second to pick on one of the conditions, you realize that it's not just your doctor you're connecting this patient to, but it can also be um, a nutritionist. As, and the nutritionist could be one of the most influential uh, people in this person's life until they reach a crisis moment. So um, who's in pain? Really, everyone's in pain. Um, and the real question is, is how are they making it how are they making it go away? And I think the one thing that, that, that they all share is agreement that it's all about having a data strategy, how do you better connect, and how do you use the information? Absolutely. All right. Chapter three, the rise of digital health. Wow. We are so okay. blessed to be living in this age where an enormous amount of funding is going towards digital health. And I, specifically being a woman, am just thrilled when I see the number of um, startups that are focused on women's health oh, God. and the amount of money that's going into that. So it just warms my heart to see what's out there. Talk a little bit about for those who are not familiar with what the heck is digital health? <laughs> and um, you know, talk a little bit about the, the coming of the, the digital health 3.0. Sure. I mean, I, I message it this way. Um, I define digital health as the intersection of technology, healthcare, and consumers. And I, I refuse to call them patients or members, right? And I keep it high level like that because you kind of get rattled into this whole discussion around, well, what is it? Is it your smartphone? Is it your Apple Watch? Is it your Fitbit? Um, is it the population health management tool that you use to help you with your diabetes? The answer is, is it's really all of that. So if you kind of take a look at the brief history, um, I think most people uh, agree that it really, really, really took off and got legs um, after the ACA kicked in and started changing uh, how doctors were remunerated for the services that they provided. So we're kind of moving from a fee-for-service to a more value-based uh, care model, and you need data to be able to do that. But, you know, we should also give props to George Bush because I think George W. Bush was the first to recognize that you can't do any of that if you don't have an electronic health record. And, and he really kicked this all off in 2004, mandating that hospitals and providers everywhere um, adapt an EHR strategy. So it's been around since 2004 or 2012, depending on, you know, really your perspective. But um, I think the whole explosion uh, really took off in 2012 when you saw a flood of investments, a flood of new technologies. And you were right, some of them beautifully focus on, on things like women's health. Uh, Wildflower Health is a great company that comes to mind. It was started by a woman who was very frustrated with her prenatal care experience. So she developed a solution that was all about helping expecting mothers. And she quickly pivoted and realized that expecting mothers quickly become new, new mothers. And so they're, they still have needs and she's kind of morphed into and pivoted into uh, what I call family health. Um, the woman, um, every, every, every household has a, uh, a CEO of health and it's typically the mom, right? So uh, I think Leah figured out, Leah Sparks, the founder and CEO of uh, Wildflower Health figured out that uh, um, there are special needs that every family have and it's a, typically a woman that's making those decisions. And so she's crafted an entire solution set around meeting that woman, that mom's needs. So um, it's kind of fun. If you look across the board, whether you're a fit and active guy whether you're a, a, a new mom or whether you're someone that's managing a chronic condition, um, chances are there's something that has developed since 2012 that you can connect with using just your phone. Um, and whether you know about it or not um, is why I wrote the book. Really, there's a ton of innovation and a ton of exciting things you can connect to, but not many people know about it yet. So, I mean, let's amplify their voices. All right, chapter four, the road back from broken. What's, a, what's that about? Um, yeah, the road back from broken. Um, you know, I think what we're really realizing is uh, a couple things in this chapter. One, they're manageable. We can do something about them. Um, you know, I, I think if you look at last century, we were dying from things that we caught when we left our house. I mean, from tuberculosis to the flu to, I mean, you name it. 
Um, these were afflictions that we had really little say over um, and it was random and haphazard and some of it was hereditary and some of it was not. This century is from things that we do to ourselves. So, um, I, you know, I think what you've seen is um, each segment of the value chain, whether it's your provider, whether it's your, your insurance partner, um, whether it's an innovator, um, they're all developing solutions that better engage with you, better collect data that they can later come back and add some value to your life with. So when we talk about the road back from broken, we're really taking a look at, all right, who's making some progress here? Who's doing what? And we interviewed, um, I, I think, Mayo, Harvard Medical, Evergreen Health up in the Pacific Northwest, and my, and my favorite, one medical based right here in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. What are you doing to, to, what technologies are you using to better connect and is it helping? Um, so we talk a little bit about um, what they're doing and the value that they can provide to you and how you can better connect to them. And that's an example on the provider side. We also did the same thing with your insurance provider in terms of helping you select a plan, helping you select uh, and choose your doctor and why and who in your zip code can provide the best value at the best cost um, and how to steer you toward that as a resource. I have to ask, uh, what is your favorite digital health tool for your own personal health care? Oh, wow. You know, I, I still use the, the tool that I, I started back in 2011. <laughs> I, use, I, use a, I use a consumer health score. Um, it, it, it's real popular in Europe. It's not so popular here in the United States. Don't even ask me why. But um, the reason I like to use this tool is it helps me track about 105 different activities. And it surrounds me with a coach. And it helps me measure things in a way that's simple and easy for me. I have a, a, I have a health score. And when my health score is below 700, I'm not active enough. I'm not eating well. I'm not sleeping enough. I'm not doing one of the three fundamental things that comprise my health um, to the best extent that I can. Um, so I, I like this because I, it just dumbs it down for me. Um, if I'm a 680, I strive to be above a 700. And if I'm a 720, I know that between 700 and 720, um, I'm probably in good health because my, my weight's at a manageable level, my BMI is healthy, my blood pressure is healthy, um, my body fat is in a manageable range, I'm getting enough sleep, um, and I'm not a real stressed guy. So boom, there you go. I've got all those things available at my fingertips in one app. Um, I still like using the company uh, uh, product that I started back in 2011. All right, chapter five, the real value of connecting. Talk a little bit about that. Well, um, I think what the real value of connecting is, is what you saw in the digital health um, 1.0 explosion was just an explosion of apps, right? In, in, in Digital Health 2.0, you saw just the opposite of that. You saw um, all this data that was created um, in this, I, we call, sometimes call this the quantified self movement, but this is where big data really entered into the picture. But you know what, Rena? at this point in time, the smartest people in the room are still looking backwards and saying, hey, I can tell you what just happened. And I, I think what we're seeing right now is something completely different. And I think what you're seeing right now is a change in mindset from some of the most innovative companies out there. Walgreens comes to mind. And the question that they ask is, who can we connect this data to to make your life a better journey, right? Mm -hmm. who, how can we take action on the data? And so when you start with data as a strategy, you realize, wow, this is a real versatile asset that we have and the smartest thing that we can do is to become very good at connecting it, connecting you to all the stakeholders who help keep you, you healthy. And, and we're, we're really appreciating now that that's not just your doctor and that's not just your clinician. That's the guy at the gym that you've been paying to work out with to help keep you healthy. That's a nutritionist. That can be many things within the value chain, but the, the, the challenge is really consistent. It's remarkably straightforward. Um, it's you connect, you collect, you analyze, 
and then you reconnect the data. And that's right where we are right now. I, I really think this is going to be the biggest opportunity of our of our lives in healthcare to make a, a, a big performance improvement because now we're taking individuals and we're connecting them on a one-to-one -one basis with the resource that they need, when they need it, where they need it. We're going to where they are. Fantastic. And that's for those of you, again, who are listening in who haven't uh, visited HealCircle.org. That really is our mission. It's helping people find the right practitioner, the right program, and the right path back to health for them. All right, let's get to chapter six, data gathering devices and how we use them. So what are your favorite devices and what are you seeing out there? And then let's talk about how to use them. You know, everyone's got their own favorites, right? I, I'll straight up tell you that my favorite device is what I carry with me at all times, and that's my phone. Um, it is amazing what you can use your phone to track. And it is amazing how much versatility that they're stuffing into your phone. But my wife is a big Fitbit user, right? So I think what we've learned is that you have to have this bring your own device sort of uh, mentality when you come at this from a data management perspective. Said a different way, it doesn't matter which device that you're using. Um, we need to make it as an industry as easy as possible for you to connect that to a platform that we use that can help us analyze the information in a way that's that's meaning meaningful for you. So there's a bunch of them out there. There's Garmin's, there's TomToms, there's Apple Watches. There's I think everyone's getting into the device business. Um, I don't get too distracted by the shiny objects but it is pretty fun to go look at the shiny objects every now and then. I think the important thing is, what are, they, what are these shiny objects connecting to? Because um, they're just a construct, right? They, they, right. Their, their role is to make it as easy and as frictionless as possible for us to be able to uh, connect with somebody who can use the data in a way that's meaningful for us. So what is your favorite device? I use my phone. It's my Apple phone. Um, I, and then what are the other devices other than the phone that can be used? Um, I'm an Apple guy now. I use my Apple Watch. I use my Apple phone. I've got uh, apps on my phone that I use. I like what def uh, Apple defaults us to. Um, I like how they have their health and wellness uh, categories all aligned. Um, I use Withings for um, uh, stepping on my scale every morning and my blood pressure cuff. Um, I take my blood pressure readings. It takes about two minutes. I've got a daily routine that I do. And it helps me track and align when my readings get out of whack with um, just lifestyle choices that I've made or events that, that happen to us in life that are difficult for us to put our finger on. Like um, I mentioned earlier, the one medical uh, example. Um, I noticed, and I got there with my doctor, um, that there is a certain time of year every year where my blood pressure, my weight, um, all of my biometrics seem to go into a funk. And I didn't even realize it, but it coincided with the, um, my, my father, my sister, and my brother all died within three weeks of one another. Oh, wow. um, and um, I just kind of go into a funk every fall without even realizing it. So going in, it kind of helps me focus on better nutrition choices and making sure that I'm walking enough and, and doing all the activities that I usually do that help keep me focused on the things that put me in a better frame of mind. So um, I think that uh, when we use the devices, uh, the one rule of thumb that I have is it's got to be frictionless. It's got to be easy to use. And it's, I can't be a slave to uh, using any of the devices that I'm using or any of the apps that I'm using um, to, uh, to, to keep track of, of who I am and, and how my everyday lifestyle choices uh, affect who I am in a meaningful way. So to recap, my phone, my scale, my blood pressure monitor, and my watch um, pretty much cover it for me. Is there something that you saw during your research that you're super excited about? Because that's a lot of devices. Oh, and yeah. I think we all, from a investor perspective are constantly on the hunt of how do we create a more user-friendly experience because that's going to drive adoption. Any thoughts on that? Yes, I, I think I'm going to pivot somewhat um, and answer the question a different way. 
there, there were a couple of companies that I interviewed um, for the book that just were mind-numbingly mind inspirational. Um, one was Town Hall Ventures, and one was Conseil Rosano. Um, and um, I don't speak Spanish very well at all, but it means healthy advice in Spanish. Um, and I, I get very excited about these two firms especially because the, the reason that I'm in healthcare is there are some things that we all have passion for. And um, I think solving healthcare disparities is mine, right? Uh, uh, technologies that align to or organizations that, you know, uh, reach high and want to help with social determinants are companies that will always capture my attention. Um, and so uh, Town Hall Adventures, uh, Adventures is a firm that I really get excited about because they're a venture capital fund and their, their sole mission is finding companies that are mission driven and will help the single mom that's a bus transfer away from getting her kids to see that doctor. Um, in, in they'll sacrifice ROI um, if you're a mission-driven innovator that's trying to solve a vexing problem that was largely ignored in wave one and wave two of, of digital health innovation. I think the other one is uh, Conseil Osano. Um, they basically take those technologies and they make them available to impoverished neighborhoods in places like East LA. They focus on largely Hispanic communities, um, but they basically are taking a look at, all right, how can we move the needle and who can't afford it? That's who we're going to go out and help. And I, I just get very excited about organizations like that. Because to tell you the truth, as I look at Digital Health 1.0 and 2.0, um, do we really need another Fitbit? Do we really need another population health management tool? Um, Maybe, maybe not, but the guys that get me the most excited are the guys that are trying to solve problems that others didn't think there was enough money in. So I, I really like Conseil Sano. I really like Town Hall Ventures. Um, I always message positively about those two whenever I'm asked about who gets me um, terribly excited. I think on the innovator side, there's a ton of technologies out there. Um, Vim is a is a, a steerage tool that you and I would use without even realizing that we're using it. There's no app to download, um, but they're a, a solution that helps make sure that we get to the best provider in network um, to provide us with the lowest cost, best value res uh, uh, services for what we need at that particular point in time. Um, I think that's pretty cool. I mentioned one earlier, Wildflower Health. They focus on women's health and family health. I think that's pretty amazing. Um, one that's worth mentioning is Bright MD. Bright MD is a telehealth solution, and telehealth in itself is not all that terribly new or exciting. But I think Dr. Constantini has figured out that you know your telehealth tool should connect you to your doctor, not compete with your doctor. So um, I think that's pretty much a, a genius, nuance appreciation for how to get technologies like this adopted. And this is a technology that I think is very promising for helping us to address social determinants of health and healthcare disparities. Um, you take a look at, at what BrightMD is doing and you take a look at what Kaiser Permanente is doing. Kaiser Permanente is developing uh, driverless cars that can send um, an automated vehicle out to your house to take those, those biometric readings and and to do your, your health screening right there in the privacy of that car, right in front of your house. Um, you look at those kinds of things and you go, wow, there's some incredibly innovative things that are, are, are um, out there and available. And each, each company is, each provider, each payer is doing something a little different. I like BrightMD because I think it scales. Um, and the Kaiser for the just gee whiz, are you kidding me factor? Um, I think that's, that's pretty amazing. So chapter seven, Bright minds, big ideas, new ventures, and success. I think you've already been touching upon some of this um, in our previous chapter six uh, discussion. But who's the busted. brightest mind? You, you busted. You got me. You, you uh, I, I started teasing chapter seven, and it's because I get excited about Town Hall Ventures and um, uh, and Conceal Sano. I think what I'm really trying to emphasize here, more than anything else, Rena, is that. Um, you know, if you look at the, the three primary threats to uh, 
um, our healthcare system. You know, I think social determinants is one, um, you know, greed is another, and the politics of healthcare are a third. Um, and I, I think it, at a certain point in time, you need people in the industry that are willing to step up and say, be that as it may, there are still needs that need to be addressed. And sometimes we can't let ROI and money be the most weighted criteria that we use in determining whether or not we invest in solutions like this. So um, I really tried to double down and, and kind of share with people the technologies like BrightMD um, that, are, that are really highly applicable and useful in this space because these are some of the most vexing problems that we have. And I also think it's worth knowing that companies like Conseo Sano are out there servicing their actual communities because we need more Abner Mason and, and led companies like Conseo Sano and we need more organizations like Town Hall Ventures willing to invest in startups that have a great idea to help a small population of health with an overwhelming need and maybe they can't afford it. But you know, most of the investors have shied away from that because it's just not a big enough market. It's not low enough hanging fruit. And you just can't make as much money off of that. Um, I get that. I'm not here to change the world or change the industry, but I am here to champion those people that are basically taking a look at those smaller or those those smaller return areas, but larger, uh, more larger problems, more difficult and challenging to solve and taking them head on. And who's the brightest mind? Who do you look up to the most after your interviews, your 30 odd interviews? Well, oh, that is a really hard one. I, you know, I think it's not fair to rank them. I think each one of them was pretty inspirational in their own way for the contribution that they made. But I, I would have to say that the two guys that, I mean, I would pay money to go see these guys speak any and every time that they spoke uh, is Andy Slavitt from Town Hall Ventures. Um, I think Andy is what you would call a real healthcare mensch. Um, he was the guy that started Optum Ventures. They're now a $100 billion healthcare company. And I think Andy probably reached a point in his life where he said, you know, um, maybe the challenge isn't making money. Maybe the challenge is making a difference. And he has dedicated his life to helping us make a difference in healthcare. So I find him incredibly inspirational. He ran... CMS and was responsible for Medicare, Medicaid, and children's health under President Obama. Um, I think Abner Mason is a guy that basically is a cut from the same jib. He's basically taken a look at the industry innovation, taken a look at communities with areas of need, and said, I'm going to dedicate my life to making sure that these poor people and these disadvantaged people have access to the same tools the same technologies that the kids in Danville, California have access to. So those are two people that, you know, honestly, where whenever I'm stuck, whenever I get frustrated, whenever I feel like I'm not making enough of a difference, I think of these two guys and I channel them um, because they, they always bring the positive energy um, and they don't shy away from the, the, the most difficult and vexing problems that we have. They take them on head on. And we need that. We definitely need people that are out there taking on the big, big, bad problems and not fearing for whether this is going to convert into the right ROI. So uh, exciting stuff to hear. You found two such great individuals. All right, let's talk about a day in the life. <laughs> my, favorite part of the, my favorite part of the book. I begin and I kick this, this book off. Um, Largely with a you know a, a guy that's at a healthcare conference listening to people drone on and on about you know here's the problem statement here's the problem statement here's the problem statement you know my dad used to say all right well what are you doing about it right so I I just let my mind wander back to when I was a kid about how active I was riding my bike everywhere eating wholesome foods that mom prepared for us raiding the orchards eating apples eating berries. Um, you know, hunting, fishing, you name it. We were always on the go and we were healthy. I think my joke was, is I, I, I bet I lived at the corner of healthy and happy before it became a Walgreens tagline. And I, I had this epiphany moment and that's the, that was simply this. You know, we, we can't solve healthcare. We can't expect to solve healthcare with an ACA or an ACO alone. 
right? I mean, the ACA, the uh, Affordable Care Act, and an ACO, right. an Accountable Care Organization for for the uh, you know your 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 viewers who who don't know what those are. Um, we have a participative role to play, right? So I realized that I needed to rediscover the lifestyle that delivered to to Kevin the very best health ever. And I need to surround myself with tools and technologies that would help me get there. So today, a day in the life for Kevin is I get up in the morning, I step on my scale, I take my blood pressure readings. By the way, I do that um, later on in the day with the blood pressure as well. Um, I walk to the train station, which is a three mile walk. Um, I walk to the gym, which is a three mile walk. Not always on the same day, but I try to average between five and eight miles a day, every day. And how do you do that? Well, whenever you drive somewhere, you park as far away from the building as you can, so you have to hoof it to get in and out of the store. You take the stairs when you're confronted with, you know, climbing uh, up to the third or the fourth level, that's pretty doable, that's pretty achievable. Um, so a day in the life for me today is, is I eat wholesome foods that I prepare for myself. I try to do a salad, at lunch, I surround it with a protein. Um, I walk everywhere. Um, I still ride my bike. I go to the gym. I'm in my 60s now, so the sports have all changed. I'm not doing high impact things like I used to. But what I always encourage people to do is develop a routine and be faithful to your routine. You'd be amazed at how addicting we get in the comfort of uh, uh, patterns and in, in uh, uh of behaviors that we repeat every day. And if those behaviors include walking everywhere, watching what you eat, cutting back on your alcohol, um, you'll be the best version of yourself that you can possibly be. Um, I like to tell people, I've been a skinny guy my whole life. I actually played professional basketball in Europe. Um, and then one day I woke up and I weighed 238 pounds. And mm. how does that happen, right? So I, I just rediscovered the things about my lifestyle choices um, that really deliver good health to me. And I tried to replicate that in my 60s. So um, my message to everybody is, you know, we can fix healthcare, but we do have a participative role to play, right? I mean, we have to be accountable and responsible for our own health. Um, and we need to take ownership of what that means for each and every one of us. We'll surround you with tools. We'll tweak the remuneration models and, and uh, build incentives in for your providers and for your payers, but you still gotta participate. You still gotta play. Absolutely. Any last piece of advice for someone who's dealing with a chronic illness, which could be anywhere from autoimmune to gut issues to diabetes or cancer, what is your big advice to them in terms of digital health? What can they do starting right now to get to the shorter path to health, as we say? Well, that's a, such a big question, but it's not only a, a good question, it's the right question. I think the smartest thing that you can, you can encourage people to do is, you know, don't give up. Um, there are many patients out there just like you, and, and several of them, are thriving with their condition. So the question you really need to ask yourself is how can, I, how can I thrive with my diabetes? How can I thrive with whatever condition I'm managing? And if you find populations of health that look a lot like you, you take a look at what tools and, 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 and coaching and content that they're surrounding themselves with and check the efficacy rates on what's working. Um, what does your doctor like to use to better connect um, and is that enough? I mean, one of the things that I think that digital health assets have changed, um, two, two very important things. One is it's given us an opportunity to have a more participative patient. Um, one of my favorite authors in this space is Dr. Eric Topol. And Topol has written about three books now, I think. Um, my favorite was uh, The Patient Will See You Now. Um, the other was the creative deconstruction of medicine, and his last one was deep medicine. And I think the, one, the reason I like the middle one is, is because it really basically drives home the point that your doctor isn't the center of your, uni your healthcare universe. 
you are the center of your healthcare universe. He's just in your orbit or she's That's right. in your orbit, That's right? True. So you have to uh, basically think about yourself that way. Um, and it is not a bad thing to research your condition. It is a bad thing to try and, and self-diagnose it and treat it, right? Um, what your doctor wants is for you to be more knowledgeable and for you to be more participative, not for you to try to take her out of the loop. Um, and and um, I mean, you know, she spent many years at, at uh, med school to get the knowledge and is driven and on fire to impart that knowledge to help you in a way that helps keeps you healthy. So don't try to out doctor your doctor, but definitely come in informed and participative um, and cognizant of the type of coaching and, and nutrition and, and exercise and, and medicinal therapeutical resources that are available to somebody um, like yourself. That sounds fantastic. Kevin, thank you so much again for coming, visiting with us today, for sharing your insights and uh, for writing this great book, The Digital Health Revolution. And for the rest of you out there, check out the book. We're going to put the link in our show notes and take charge. And uh, Kevin said you can figure out who out there is thriving. As you know, at Heal Circle, we say go the next step, find out who's reversed it. You, this is not a life sentence. These chronic diseases are not life sentences. There are people just like you that have reversed them. And there's so many tools out there to help you today. Track yourself, fix what's broken, get back your health. I did, so can you, and stay smiling. I'm gonna see you on the next Healthier Podcast. If you like this, share it and subscribe. I'll see you soon.